Williams, pediatric speech language pathologist, and welcome to our podcast number 439, Coaching Parents of Autistic Children, brought to you by my website, Teach Me to Talk, where we're the largest online ASHA approved provider for early intervention CEUs. This is the third course in this podcast series called Beginning Speech Therapy with Autistic Children. Now, what's so special about this series to me is that we are using video clips to really illustrate and analyze what's going on with the child so that you can find the very best solution or strategies for the problems that you're finding, whether you're a therapist working with a whole caseload of children or a parent uh, who has a child with autism. So this course is adapted from a course that I taught all around the United States live and on DVD. Therapist, you can get CE credit for this course in our $10 CEU program, and that link is right here below. And parents, we also have handouts of the podcast available for you as well uh, for purchase, and you can get those, again, separately or with that CE credit. So let's get started. Now, in this podcast, in this course, we are discussing something today that is so important for providers of early intervention and pediatric services, and that's coaching parents. Now, in my opinion, this is never more important than when we're working with a child with autism or a child who's displaying characteristics of autism, even if they're not diagnosed yet. So coaching is an overriding principle that I've used forever in this field, long before coaching became a buzzword or became kind of a popular term. We used to call this parent education. Some therapists think about parent Parent education. They think that that's just a brief summary at the end of a session. Oh, he did great today and we worked on this and da 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 da. That's not what we're going to be talking about in this course today. We're going to talk about hands on what we do within the context of a session. Now, I'm not slamming you if all the time that you get to see with a parent is in the context of an IEP meeting or an IFSP meeting or uh, even, again, like I mentioned, at the end of a session. And any contact with a parent is better than nothing. <laughs> so even if you are just mostly texting or emailing or whatever it is that you've chosen, how, however it is you've chosen to communicate with the families and the parents of children on your caseload, we've got to just make sure that we are tweaking and doing everything we possibly can to help a parent get the strategy so that they can use them at home. Now, ideally, again, this is what we're going to talk about today, the ideal situation with coaching. And that really means that we work directly with the parents who work directly with the child as we make recommendations or as we follow through with whatever our parent coaching model happens to be. However, before we get started with this, I really want to issue a big, big caution. As an early, inter early intervention provider, or as a therapist who might work in a state early intervention program where they are really emphasizing coaching as the only methodology that you would ever use in the context of a session, don't let yourself get talked out of the idea that you can't do anything with a child. And here's why that's important. We have got to be able to model these strategies. So even if you are still doing teletherapy, and I got a couple of emails yesterday that asked me for some specific teletherapy ideas. Even when we're doing that, we need to really, really be focused on how can we tweak what a parent is doing. This isn't just about my session, my one time a week, or whatever we get to get with the child, how many ever visits we're assigned by the payer source. We've got to make sure that no matter what we're doing with that, that we, that we are m making sure that we model these strategies. So again, here's my point. Even if you're, you are doing teletherapy, even if your work is mostly consultative, you've still got to find a way so that a parent can see the strategy in action. Now, some parents are not completely comfortable with the model that we talked about, the ideal model where they are doing the work with the child and we're in the back coaching. Some parents just aren't comfortable with that. We have to always remember to meet them where they are because they're not getting really really make any progress or make any changes when they are in a place of unfamiliarity or they are, are again uncomfortable with what you're asking them to do. So we have to first figure out where parents are, meet them where they are, and then run with that because coaching is going to be a big, big part of our treatment plans. Parents are with their children hours and hours and hours and hours and hours more than we ever will be, or even even as a teacher in a program. And so again, it's so important to get these, these things going. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about not only how to coach, 
parents of autistic children, but the very first kinds of strategies that we teach them. And again, I want these to be really generalizable strategies so that they can use the strategies in lots of different contexts, no matter what new skill they're teaching the child. So when we begin talking about coaching parents, I like to say that starts immediately. That even starts during the assessment. And this does not, this is not specific to just speech language pathologists. It applies to all disciplines and all interventions. And so a lot of coaching is really explaining to parents what we're doing and talking them through whatever it is that we're doing. And again, that might be them assisting you during the evaluation process, you know, with, oh, you know, it'd be better if we could get him to sit down right here and, and see if uh, how, how well we can get him to attend to this what are your ideas with that even that's part of coaching with with having a parent participate with you having a parent share information with you and we're going to talk about that later as we go so again I began coaching even during that very first session or even if that's an assessment or an evaluation and that would be include explaining uh, the test results so that a parent can understand okay this is what's happening with my child this is what I'm seeing as the professional let's talk about what you're seeing and then let's talk about how we can uh, help you implement that information and those recommendations and so let's take a look at our first video clip in this course this is my little friend Anna Marie and here I'm meeting with her parents I'm going to show you two clips back to back and we're just uh, thinking about how we begin these initial coaching opportunities even during an evaluation about last time sure. We're going to, I wanted you to watch copies of the DVDs. Mm -hmm. Did y'all get to do that? Yes, we did. Good. Did it make sense after you saw me work with her and then saw your kids? Yeah, it business? clarified a lot of stuff. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were like, okay. It I'm fills in the blanks. Yeah. yeah. So and then you can go sure. back and watch it again if you need to, too. Um, for her social skills, our main thing is I want her to play with us without falling apart, without right. trying to there's a pepper to cry or you know do any of those things that three-year-olds do when they're mad yeah. and again some of it's really expected because it is age appropriate but we just wanted to be able to be redirected yeah mm -hmm. and not fall apart secondly or I guess that was number two number three her receptive language mm -hmm. we want her to understand a lot of new words especially those yes. verbs that we talked about and okay. prepositions now I've got some vocabulary lists that I'm going to give you guys oh good she already has all these naming words. She's got a ton of now. <laughs> right. But we're really going to work on action words and prepositions. And these are the ones that are age appropriate through three. She's over three, but this is what we have to work on first. Remember last time we talked about, that. yeah, we got to mm -hmm. fill in those gaps <laughs> first. And then we can move forward. Right. Okay. And then. I put a little goal in here about following a lot of directions in the context of games and you probably saw some little games on the DVD right. and we mm -hmm. did some of that last week. We're going to do a lot of that today. Okay, great. And then expressive language, we're going to work on her just using a lot of phrases mm -hmm. to express her wants and needs mm -hmm. and talk with you in conversation. Yeah. And not quote Toy Story and all that other stuff. She's, been, she's gotten away from a lot of that Yay! just in this last week. Yeah, we have like, no shows. So thrilled. Yeah. Has been, that been hard for y'all? A little bit. I think it's been harder on her than it is us. Yeah, really. I think it's that used really, to be our one, like, let's catch a break now. Uh -huh. For 30 you know? minutes and yeah. yeah. And you know, and you can still <laughs> do that if it's an and when the new baby comes, <laughs> we, it might be in she'll be room. further along. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and you just want to use that when you absolutely. I think that's what we had discussed was option. getting her where she needs to be before we bring that back into everything. And that, that's right. ideal. And yeah. if you guys have come to that conclusion, mm -hmm. that's perfect. <laughs> but I never want you to feel like I'm shoving that down your throat. Oh. Oh, but you can see a we, lot of difference with kids mm -hmm. just in how able how they're able to interact better right. and respond better to real life people yeah. when you let go of right. the TV stuff. Right. Yeah, so y'all are doing great. Yeah. Ideal parents, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last time it didn't make sense. Anything you want to see me do today hmm. anything that you thought okay that didn't go like we thought I think one thing we were having trouble with was on top under that kind of stuff okay she wasn't do you know why because she's not there yet okay. these are the words we're doing well, that's what i am that's why i brought you we, a list we probably yeah because we thought <laughs> we okay, watched those we'll videos and we said we'll just jump in and, and try yeah. some of these and that's rooms. okay the things we're going to do first, up, down, in, out, off, on. When you start saying on top, 
it throws kids. Mm -hmm. If you just stick to on, they're going to get it here and there. So those are the prepositions. And so under is not on there yet. Under, gotcha. around, behind, beside, those are things that typically come in between three and a half and four. Even though she's that age, she's not there yet. Right. Wise. So we need to make sure we master all of this. And when I see her doing all this, then we're going to get a new sheet and bump up to a new level. Okay. But until then, we're going to stick to this. Sure. And see, and the other thing that's going to happen with Anne Marie is she understands these words. Mm -hmm. But when you put two steps in there, I want you to take Woody and put him in the chair and then take Jesse and uh, take her out of the car. Even right. though in and out of those work, she's got all that other junk in there. Too and it just makes her confused. Oh. Yeah. So we're going to just stick to this really simple level and then I got you. forward. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. So I think the list will really help you. Yeah, that definitely gives us more yeah. of a defined. Yeah. Okay. And again, she probably understands most of these words, but mm -hmm. if you put them, that list, she knows. Yeah, but if you put them in the context of a command, I mean, I want her following these like it's this the easiest thing she's ever done and not look like she's struggling. Right. And she may get here pretty quickly, and that means that you've done a good job. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So don't We're feel doing. like, oh gosh, we don't have enough to do. There's tons more to do after this. But we have to start, like I gave you that analogy about algebra. Yeah. We have to start with addition and subtraction. I thought we have tried to explain it to everyone. So. <laughs> yeah, and that yeah. usually makes sense to people. Right. That right. you got to cover the bases. They were great parents and a really, really wonderful family to work with. So let's talk about what we're going to do to move past that. So when we focus on coaching parents, no matter what we're doing, no matter what the goal is, the specific intervention, no matter whether you are a speech language pathologist like me, an OT, an early intervention specialist, a social worker, whatever it is, these are the kinds of techniques that we're going to use and when we're focusing uh, again on on helping parents and creating that competency and that mastery of these skills with the parents but here's the kicker though and i've already mentioned it but i want to mention it one more time you cannot teach a parent how to do something that you cannot do so you have got to be able to do that first and so again i believe that we should model every strategy and every single thing that we expect a parent to do not only so that they can see it work ideally or correctly or accurately but also because we're not perfect either and we're working with another human being the child who who knows what's you know going to happen with him whether he's going to respond as we would expect him to respond or whether there will be additional tweaking and again you don't know that as a professional unless you've modeled these strategies and techniques and unless you see how the child responds now again we can coach a parent through all this just by talking and certainly I've done that since 2008 and teach me to talk. So it can certainly be done. A parent can certainly take one of my treatment manuals and work independently with a child or read a strategy and then do their own tweaking. But it's so much more effective when they have the benefit of your professional expertise and experience. And so again, that modeling piece is so critical, not only so they can see how the strategy should look, but so that a parent can see how to respond when it's not working. And so that you can come up with additional strategies too so that you're not left just wondering, why isn't that working? Sometimes the parent doesn't always, they're not always able to communicate what's going on with their child. And you can see something that maybe a parent doesn't see. And so modeling, again, is so critical. It's supported by research. It's a vital component of coaching. And don't let your programs talk you out of it. All right, so I mentioned vital component of coaching. So let's go ahead and take a look at evidence-based practice now with what research tells us would be the best components to include in any kind of parent coaching model, whether you adapt the one that I recommend today, which is really easy, by the way, or whether you're using something as uh, required by your state early intervention program or whatever your agency happens to use. So the, the piece of research that we're referring to right now is the cornerstone with coaching research. And no matter whether you're reading Rush and Sheldon or any other early intervention uh, gurus that uh, try to educate you about parent coaching, it all kind of comes back to this Dunstan Trivet 2009 uh, research piece where they looked at lots of different studies and picked out the most effective components. And so let's talk about what these are. So the first one is plan 
planning. So the planning phase, and there are two parts with this, and you'll find this information on your handout. I think that I mentioned that earlier. You can always purchase this handout so that you can follow along, even if you don't need the CE credit piece. So planning. So that includes introducing the strategy uh, to the parent. And again, sometimes we think about introducing here in terms of whatever our activity is going to be, and we certainly need to do that, whether we're going to say, okay, what I would like for us to do today, you know, you've mentioned that it's a difficult, you have some difficulty uh, uh, knowing what he wants to eat. And so you would like for him to be able to tell you what he wants to eat. Well, he can't quite do that because we don't have the vocabulary yet. So maybe we should try some choices. And so instead of kind of having snack time as your focus here, you're going to talk about what your strategy would be, which would be we're going to introduce choices at snack and see if we can get some kind of response. And you talk with a parent about that. You know, what are the kinds of responses that, that you're seeing him do now? What are the kinds of responses that we want him to do? And again, this is very intentional planning so that we're, we're looking at, again, not only what the activity is, you know, and you could also say in this, hey, and we're going to do this in snack time today, but after we're finished, let's think about something else that we can do with him. What would be something else where you feel, another context where you feel like your child has difficulty expressing what he wants to do? Where how, And just walk through that process. And you may make some suggestions. You may say, well, how about playtime? How about uh, how about if you're going to read a book together? How about uh, during bath time? Anything. So walk them through again those daily routines and really use your your strategies or use your questions that you ask them during the IFSP process to get those initial results. You're going to use those here even in the context of developing specific uh, therapy activities to do during uh, the session. And again, this is going to include whether you are in a home-based program, which of course I think our early intervention state programs have done a, an excellent job of teaching us how important it is to incorporate what a family, their, their existing routines, and let's not go in with tons of new stuff unless a family needs that kind of overhaul with their structure, but lots of times they're already doing so many things so well, and so we talk with them about that, and we help them see, again, not only where they need help with the child, but also what's going really well. So that might be something else that you talk about here. You know, what what is there some, is there some other uh, th daily event that you do with him where he's already doing better than he does normally how could we how could we Im implement this strategy like choices into that routine and so again you're taking what they already do so that's the introduction piece so the official definition here would be that we engage learners in a preview of the material of the knowledge or the practice that's the focus of the instruction or training and again for us as therapists we're usually talking about okay what's the specific strategy that I'm teaching you today or want to teach you today or want to want to practice today and then number two how are we going to accomplish that? What's our material? What's our activity for this? And so that's a great, uh, great way to do that. Then, and that usually happens at the beginning of a session where you are planning this with what you're going to do. And this is what I was going to say before. Our state programs have really gotten us to uh, address what a family already does and really to include their daily routines and think about, again, their strengths as well as their weaknesses when we're planning these things. But sometimes in a clinical setting or in an academic setting, and especially if parents aren't participating in an academic setting, let's, let's talk about a clinical setting. Sometimes we don't do this as well <clears throat> pardon me, when a child is coming to see us in our office as we would if we were going to their home. So even this practice piece, you know, you may feel like I've already pulled together all my toys for today or all my materials. And so that's not going to be as important as talking to mom about that. But when we were running our uh, mission-based clinic in Kentucky, I found it to be just vital to talk to a parent at the beginning, even if I already had a plan for what my session was going to be. And I, you know, we do that. We certainly do that. But it really was important to talk to your parent even at the beginning and again uh, just to illustrate and just to help them understand and introduce what the day is going to be especially at the beginning of therapy especially when you're new to them and they're new to you and you're the child you're getting to know the child and getting to know them so even if they're coming to us in a clinical setting you know that might be something you do as you walk back to uh, from the lobby to the room you're talking with the parent you know sometimes we're saying how did it go last week and that's great 
But we might need to shift that a little bit and say, what do you want to work on today? This is what I had in mind uh, and, and, and include that as we're having those conversations with, you know, how did it go? How, what happened last week with, or during the time that I've seen you last with the strategies. All right, so the next piece of the planning uh, uh, program here, part of the program would be illustrating. And so we've talked about that with modeling. So here we're demonstrating or modeling how to use or apply whatever strategy, knowledge, or practice that we want them to do. And so again, vital, vital part and this, uh, if, you, if you have supervisors or have programs that are really challenging you on that direct service provision piece that they don't really want you to directly do anything with the child, it's evidence-based practice that we model these strategies. So I want to be sure that you know that. All right, the next piece of this is the application piece. So this is, we've already planned, we've already gotten that going, next we're going to go apply it. So this is where we actually engage the learner. And again, the learner here is not the child. Who's the learner in this? The learner is the parent or the caregiver, whoever you as the therapist or professional would be coaching. So we're going to engage the learner in the use of the material knowledge or practice. And so that means we just just do it. We do the activity together or we use the strategy. And again, let me say, activities are important and we're going to talk about that, but so many times parents link the strategy only to the one or two activities that you've done within that and they don't know how to generalize, which is the same exact issue <laughs> that we face with our little clients, right? And so we have to help parents as we are doing this application portion talk about uh, that's why we talk about a lot of different activities and that's why sometimes I say okay here's our strategy here's choices we can do it in snack time we can do it with a play routine we can do it when we read a book we can do it when we're getting dressed to go outside and play and you walk them through that so they start to think oh this strategy isn't just linked to this and sometimes again the most success they're going to have in carrying over these strategies are things that you've done with them in the session because they're more skilled at that. They've had they've seen you do it. They've they've had the opportunity again for their to practice with you, with their coach right there. And so we have to be sure again that we are uh, giving them enough examples and enough experiences so that they can generalize and can use these strategies across the board, across all the activities that they're doing at home. The next part of application, uh, according to the research too, is evaluating. So we're engaging the learner in the process of evaluating the consequence or the outcome of the application of the material knowledge or practice. And so even as we are applying it, we're starting to say, say th ask questions like, how, how, how do you think you're doing with this? How does this feel to you? Uh, or, and I usually do it in the context of me, uh, me giving that feedback, which we're gonna talk about in the next section. And some programs don't like this. They want you to just, say something to the parent and let them draw their own conclusions but I am such a praise junkie it is hard for me not to offer that especially when I see a parent well all the time even if they're struggling I think praise praise is fantastic because they need to recognize what they're doing that's right how this is changing even if the child is struggling but the parent is doing a beautiful job of implementing or trying to implement the strategies we want to be sure to reinforce that and we know just as therapists even you know forget the adult learning models we know that, that we all work better when we feel like that we've already got some sense of accomplishment going. And sometimes parents really don't realize that until they're hearing that feedback from you. So even if they're struggling, even when they're not struggling, you want to say, wow, that was a great job of that. You did such a good job uh, with, with using those choices. Look at that you, and, and quantify it, say, I, you, I've, been, I've been keeping my little uh, data on you over here. You gave him 10 different choices during that activity. That was, or you know, choices at a time, you know, episodes of choices. I don't want you to think that that's what we're doing. You know, I'm going to offer my child 10 things to pick from. No, I'm meaning that if choices is your strategy, that a parent would have offered two different choices, you know, 10 different times throughout the activity. And so you give them really, really, really specific feedback like that to help them evaluate. Or you might have, it might be the opposite. You might say, you know, we were working on choices and that's great, but we only did it one or two times. We, we gotta try again, we need to do better this time. Let's, let's offer some more. And so you might, that's where you might jump in a little bit or where again, 
that coaching piece where maybe you're not interrupting, maybe you're not, maybe you are respecting the flow of the activity and the dynamic between the parent and the child, but you may just be sitting there going, oh, here's a good time, try it now, try choice now. And so those kinds of things I think are really, really important and we evaluate as we go, not necessarily always at the end. So that's the application process. And then here, the last piece of this is the deep understanding. So we really think about this as comprehension or mastery. Does a parent really, get the strategy do they own it yet with what we're trying to teach them and so there are two pieces of this again according to the researchers one is reflection and so this would be what we're talking about after the fact we engage the learner in a kind of self-assessment of, of his or her acquisition of the knowledge and skills as a basis for identifying the next steps in the learning process so again this goes beyond the evaluation piece where we're just talking about within the context of the activity how did that go how's that feeling Da, 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 da. This is after, after it's over. And this might be, again, after the specific activity where you're talking about it. And I'm going to show you lots of examples of this with parents in sessions with me where we're kind of problem solving and thinking through things together. How did that go? How do you, how do you feel like you did during that? And, and, and those kinds of opportunities where they really are becoming more and more aware of not only what their child did and how their child responded, but how they responded. Or, or a lot of times parents will say, oh, it, I, thought I, was, I thought I was gonna do better than that. I thought it would go better than that. I thought I would remember better. And again, you just remind them, this is just practice. We're all working on this. And certainly, let me just say this, this is something I say to parents too. And I'll say it right now about the, the video clips that we're going to see. Every time I see a video clip of myself, I think, oh, I could have done this. Oh, oh, oh. And that's always for us. For next time, I will do this. Or the next set of parents I work with, I'm going to say this. Or next time I come back to their home, I'm going to be sure that I talk about this because I can, I can do a better job with that. And again, it's not to be reflective in a negative sense with, this is you know all negative feedback blah 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 but we can also do some positive things and some things again that just continue to sharpen our own clinical skills in addition uh, as same thing that we're doing with parents and so we want to be sure that we're thinking about that so the reflection piece is really really important and if you as a therapist i'm sure you already do that i'm sure you use that time or your time at the end of the day or again even in the middle of the session to think wow this is I, i've got to do something different here or this is great this is going fantastic and so we want to be sure that we that we continue to do that even professionally to develop and th this is a critical part too of the continuing education process where you watch clips of other professionals or where you hear ideas or hear strategies and you're thinking do I do that and how can I be better with this how can I just not dismiss this piece of information that I'm taking the time to sit and listen to today what can I do to really change what I do tomorrow and change what I do next week and next month and next year so that I get better and better? And again, that's the same process that we want to help our parents go through. And then this last phase of this is mastery. And this is where we engage the learner in some kind of formal kind of assessment where they compare themselves to a conceptual or a practical model or framework or some other external set of standards or criteria. In a lot of state early intervention programs right now, I know in my uh, other home state of Kentucky, they've done a good job of uh, implementing some parent coaching and there's some mastery involved where they have some videotapes and then uh, they get scored the providers are scored on how they're doing and on how they reach their competencies. And so certainly, will we do that with parents with, with this? You could, and I guess some programs are kind of doing that, but mostly this is just going to be helping a parent become more and more aware of what they're doing with their child so that they can, like we want to get better and better and better at helping their child compensate and really using strategies that are successful. All right, so we've walked through those six components of effective coaching, and again, that's research-based. So I've kind of boiled that down into something that would be really easy, and I've used this model for a long time. If you've heard me teach this class live or uh, read any of my work at Teach Me to Talk or any other kind of training course that you've done. I've talked about this parent model, uh, but, but I want to be sure that you uh, get it today and that you understand that this does, even though it's an easier way to do it, include all of those six components. So I like this one too because it's something that it's a tagline and I've found that if I say the same things to parents over and over again, it's like a verbal routine and they remember it and then they're actually able to 
take this again and incorporate it at home and generalize it. So they're thinking, what do I need to do here? And sometimes I'll talk to moms about this and I'll, you know, they're complaining that dad's not, dad's not on board like they would like him to be or grandma or the babysitter. And I'll say, well, you know what? You can do the same, you can teach them the same way that we do it here in the session. And that's what these three steps is introduce, do, and review. And so what is introducing is discussing the strategy, discussing the activity, talking about how it should look. Uh, even kind of walking through gathering our materials really the prep piece so we're gonna we're going to get ready for the next piece which is actually the doing and so this is implementing a strategy within an activity and again I think it's really really clear I'm gonna say it one really really important to be clear with the parent about this and to say this is our strategy but these are the five different activities we could do this in what would you like to do today which one do you think would be most helpful which context do you think your child is going to have the best success and maybe the worst success? And sometimes that's what I like to do is kind of, I want to see him at his best with this, where mom thinks the strategy will go great. Uh, maybe a preferred activity or maybe maybe something brand new that she thinks kind of is going to be cool and he's not going to lapse into sort of the other problem things that we see. Some kids do better with novelty. Lots of our little guys who are on the autism spectrum, particularly the younger they are, they actually seem to do a little bit better with the familiar. And why is that? Because of the core diagnostics, uh, core, one of the core diagnostic features of autism is that insistence on sameness. Now, if that's a new word for you, core diagnostic feature of autism, I want you to go back and listen to the first two shows in this series, 437 and 438, where we are walking through that official diagnostic criteria and we're looking at those core deficits of autism so that you can really, really understand what those things mean. And again, if you can take that information and then apply it here with what we just said about activities, maybe with a kid who has terrible transitions or who doesn't like new things, maybe for him at the beginning of therapy when we are just trying to get that relationship established and when we want to start off just in the in the most positive light that we would do things that are more familiar. And so again, that's why I like this model and like this, you know, this is our strategy, mom and dad, and here are four or five ideas that I've come up with. What do you think he's going to do best in? And what do you think he's going to do worst in? And let's let's try that. Let's just kind of get the the either side of the pendulum swing here and kind of look, look at that and see how we might adjust that. So that might be an idea for you to do too. All right, so we talked about introduce. We talked about do. And the last piece is review. So we talk about how it went. And again, this might be immediately following the activity. It might be at the end of a session. It might be after you've done the same things for a few weeks, you think, okay, part of this next session really needs to be us sitting down and talking about how things are going. And then not just kind of the review, but how are we gonna use that information to help us move forward? What, what, what's that next step? And so those are really, really important things to think about. All right, so again, we've compared that to the Dunst and Trivet model with introducing is the planning piece, doing is the application piece, and then reviewing is that deep understanding or mastery piece. They're, you know, if, even though th these approaches are, are similar and they have the same components, to me, it really doesn't matter what I call it as long as, again, those pieces are there. And so let's go ahead. We talked about kind of the, the beginning, our introduce, do, review. That would be our process that we're going to use. Now let's move on and talk about some other really, really important factors and some other variables that we want to be sure that parents, especially parents of, of children with autism, understand can be very, very important to their success. And again, these are on your handout if you want to look at these, but timing is the very first thing. Timing is everything, right? And again, especially at the beginning when something is brand new. So I like to talk to parents of children with autism and even it doesn't matter, autism or not, this is kind of a standard thing, but it's really, really important to talk with parents of children who are autistic about because, like we mentioned before, those core deficits of autism, which might make transitions difficult, which might make a child not want to do something new. And you know, you're a therapist, you've not known this child before, so guess what? You are the new, right? And so we have to talk with parents about the best time to teach something new is when a child is what? When he's regulated, when he's not sick or hungry or wet or extremely tired or overstimulated. You know, we want to get children in that just right place for learning 
morning. And so in therapy, this is always after a child is warmed up a bit. So I hope that you, if you're a home visit provider, that you wouldn't walk in right off the bat and start something new with the child. I hope that you wouldn't, but some kids, again, do respond best to novelty, but lots of times, and again, our kids with autism really do kind of stick to that familiar, and so that's why it's so important to talk to parents about timing. So if a child is having an off day, if he's not staying happy and regulated, that's our goal for the day, to just get him in that just right place, and then for, for these kinds of kids on these kinds of days, we're not going to start with a lot of new stuff. We're just going to work on mastery of skills that they are already that are already emerging or skills that they've already attained. When a child is truly upset or dysregulated or when there's a physical need going on, maybe he's hungry, we don't try to teach anything new. We get them calm first. We just offer support first. And the more kinds of uh, meltdowns that you would see from a child, maybe from sensory processing overload, the more that that's going to be important. And so you talk with parents about that and you, you know, you, you don't do it to the point that you say, hey, listen, if he's, if he's just had an eyelash fall out, we're going to cancel therapy today. That's not what we mean. What we mean is even the timing for them using strategies, not only in the session, but at home. If they're having a particularly hard day, they're going to want to back off using the newest strategies. They're going to want to look for the best possible times to introduce new strategies or to practice these skills. And so again, sometimes parents don't think about that. They don't think about how therapeutic it is or valuable it is just to help their child learn how to calm down or how to help their child learn how not to get into fight, flight, or freeze, those natural responses that we all feel when we are overstimulated or when the processing demands just exceed the capabilities of our systems. And so we have to help parents with that and talk about things like meeting a child's needs, like using our calming strategies. And again, sometimes in the middle of therapy, p parents don't always know that that's okay. They're doing behavioral redirections like straighten up, listen to her, stop that. When we really need to be helping them, you know, sometimes I'll say to a parent, would you be addressing this like this at home. Let's think about it more like that. Let me help you with how, how you know, so we want to say how you would really act. You know, you really wouldn't be doing lots of that overcorrecting, and uh, you, and that's what's causing the overstimulation. And so sometimes we have to help parents really see that, and we have to get to as close as typical as we can uh, with the child when we are in sessions with them. And so sometimes that really involves these conversations at the beginning with parents about saying, "Hey, I don't want to drive him away from me. I don't, I don't want him to get to the point that he's so mad he never wants to see me again." <laughs> and so we have to again talk about what, how timing is so important with that and then the next piece of this is being really responsive so reading a child's cues and then being super super responsive and this is so important particularly for our little guys who were say level three uh, diagnostically on the autism spectrum our children who require very substantial support to be able to participate and so we have to help parents again read their cues and be responsive now is this to say that a parent is not doing that already and that's why they're not communicating we are not saying that at all <laughs> parents most of the time are going to know better than you as a professional because they have 24 7 experience with their child how many ever days that child has been alive and so we can glean that from a lot of parents and so in the therapy session, especially these first few sessions, which is what we're talking about in this series, really beginning speech therapy with autistic children, in those first few sessions, we really want to do a good job of establishing that with that parent where we're asking, what do you think would help her right now? What usually works when y'all are working on something and when you were doing something together and this, she starts to fall apart a little bit or she tends to want to run away or she wants to rip my eyes out, right? <laughs> what do you do when this kind of thing happens and so talk with parents about that because they may have a wonderful strategy or they may have something that they're trying that you're able to just tweak a little bit and make it abundantly better for everyone involved and so talk about those things about you know this is what I'm seeing look at him right now here's this cue that I'm reading what do you think we should do? And does it feel laborious in the middle of a session to be able to do this? Or does it feel, does it take more time than if you just did it yourself and then moved on? And and could you maybe avoid a little a ten minute 
a little uh, disconnect that a child does, maybe not a full-blown meltdown because those last a lot longer than 10 minutes, but just could you avoid that? Yes, but don't pass up the opportunity with the parent to really address what's going on so that the parent can do that all day, every day, every time they're with their child and they can start to teach other people to do it. Hey, when I was in therapy last week and the speech therapist, I was doing the, he did this, Brady did this, and then I did this, and the speech therapist said, try this, and oh my goodness, this is so much easier. And so this is the kind of thing that you want to talk to parents about. And then you want to say, like we were just talking about in that introduce, do, review piece, this is what we review and we say, you did such a good job of that today. Look, he, he still, we still, uh, you know, still needed 10 minutes to kind of pull himself together before we could get back to an activity. But at the same time, it wasn't an hour. It wasn't a wasted, a whole wasted, uh, you know, long period of time here. Look how good you did, how well you did containing this whole situation. And so talk with parents about that. And so I like to use the word here, recover. How can we recover? How can we get back on track? That's a goal. And again, sometimes parents think about it just behaviorally. Is he going to say a, you know, 10 new words in today's session? Or is, how's he gonna do? For, for a lot of our little guys with autism, it's at the beginning, it's just teaching them how to stay with us and how to move on to the next activity. And again, recover when they're off. Uh, when, when they're having an off time or an off day or however you want to think about that. Now, sometimes parents and therapists will get into power struggles, and that's the next thing that I want to talk to you about. Never, ever, 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 ever get yourself in a long, drawn-out power struggle with a toddler. And why is that? It's because you will lose. <laughs> you will lose every single time. Now, you may win that temporary battle. He may put his shoes on. She may end up... I hope that you wouldn't do this with talking. She may end up saying a word or, you know, you may end up having that end result that you want, but all the yuck that occurred in between and the memories of that that you're going to have moving forward, you want to avoid that. So especially as a therapist. Now, it's hard to talk to parents about not engaging in power struggles because a lot of times as parents, you know, we feel like, we have to win. <laughs> we have to uh, make these changes. You know, kids have to eat and they have to take baths and they have to get in the car and they have to sit in the car seat and be buckled in. They have to do all those things. But at the same time, especially in the context of teaching a child how to communicate, it's not really the, the, the relationship is more important. So and the interaction is more important. So it's not really that end result if the if the way to get there. The, the ends don't always justify the means, right? And so we have to be really, really careful with that. And so when I'm seeing that kind of thing in therapy, and I talk to parents about this at the beginning, I'm just going to say, hey, you may have a different idea about these kinds of things, about how therapy should go. And, you know, I'm really not going to, quote, unquote, make him do things if I think that it's going to result in us not being able to move forward. Now, does this mean that I'm a pushover or that you should be a pushover or that, you know, anything a child wants to get, do it's okay he can pull your hair he can break the toys he can beat up his little brother in the context of the session absolutely not but we're not going to get involved in those little conflicts like you have to say milk or you can't have a drink from this sippy cup and sometimes pediatricians will make a silly recommendation like that we'll just don't give him anything to drink until he asks for it that is not going to work with a language delayed child but it's certainly not going to work with a child with autism so be sure that you're thinking about that and just trying to limit those power struggles as often as we can. And again, why would we do that? Because we want to do everything we can to avoid a child getting overstimulated, especially these first few sessions. Now, that's completely impossible. It's, it's impossible to completely avoid that, especially when we have a child who is prone to fall apart due to his sensory processing issues, a child who diff has difficulty with transitions, a child who insist on sameness with that. A child who, again, might be, uh, you might see, because I've gotten him overstimulated, then he's he's stuck in perseverative play, which, you know, would be self-stimulatory. So he's, he's tuning you out. And so, again, we can't avoid all of these things, but we should try. We should try to do everything we can to keep that child with us, to keep him, as I like to say, pleasantly participating. And especially, again, those first few sessions, you do not want to get started 
uh, off on the wrong foot where, again, you are overstimulating and you're not really reading that child's cues. All right, so let's look at this next little friend of mine. Boy, he taught me this lesson over and over and over again again during the time that I spent with his family. He did have a formal diagnosis of autism at this point. He had not had much success in therapy. They had tried a home-based model of service delivery. Then they moved him to the clinic, uh, another provider, to see if uh, that would help. And so I was coming back in, and this is maybe the second session that I worked with this family. I had evaluated him previously the year before, just kind of a second opinion, and then family came back that next year and said, hey, we'd like to work with you. And so our initial goals for this child, I just want to talk with you about what they would be. Increase his social engagement and interaction with his parents in play. Increase his attention, participation, and task completion, which is always a big uh, goal for our children with autism who again usually don't complete play routines they may not have very much interest in toys it's very difficult to get them engaged and then lastly to teach his parents strategies for playfulness so again it's much more likely that they keep him engaged and ways that a parent could entice him and woo him so that he would include her more. He had, he's a level three, uh, gotten a level three severity uh, rating with his diagnostic evaluation. And so again, here we're talking this specifically about coaching. So introduce, do, review. Remember those are our components. So we're gonna begin with an activity in this session that I thought that he liked when I saw him previously during the evaluation because he's a hard kid. You always wanna look for that. What worked? What worked last time? What did he seem to respond best to? Even if all the even if all the responses were, you know, they're all relative. So even if if he was still, it still went kind of bad, but it was better than any of the other, you know, it was better than the worse. <laughs> so here what we want to do again is pull that information forward and bring that to the next session. So things that mom and I had already talked about in that first session were, hey, really basic strategies like give him a reason to look at you if he is looking at a toy or a snack or something and he's not looking at you get your face right beside that it might be bringing that up to your face which a lot of therapists we've naturally or we've we've been trying we're not naturally doing that we've been trying to do that but a lot of times i like to put my face where he's looking so that that i'm right there and then again we can kind of you know tweak that around or whatever but those were the basic things give him a reason to look at you and and then I'm coaching mom through this. I'm saying things like we talked about before in the doing piece where we're evaluating what's going on. And we're saying, hey, go a little faster. Try it like this. And pointing out things again at the end that he did really well or even in the middle of it. Hey, he looked at you while you're doing that. Good job. That's what you wanted him to do. Give him a reason to look at you. And hey, he did it. So these are uh, good examples of that. And I'm also here setting the stage for how we want therapy to proceed. And we've talked a lot about this the better we can do this in the beginning when we're avoiding meltdowns we're avoiding overstimulation we're avoiding power struggles now we want to talk with parents too about how it should look and so you're going to hear some of that discussion too so watch uh watch these clips and then we'll talk about them more uh, uh -oh. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Wait. I love how you're reading him though. I love how you're reading him. 
you're doing, be you're doing better than you think you are, Katie. Okay. With, <laughs> with um, I mean, I, you're, I, I, don't, maybe, I don't know, maybe I said that wrong. No, no, you, no, 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 no. You're no. really, really reading his cues pretty well, really well. Oh, good. Yeah. And I'm interfering, telling you, no, no. But I just want you to have other ideas yeah. so that when you feel like it's right, right. you can jump in. No, that's, it. that's, oh. Ouch! Uh oh Oh! 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 Push! 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 Wait, 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 wait. sessions of any kind of play okay. that he allowed me to bring the ball up where I, my face was you know yeah normally yeah. when we start that kind of play then it's like okay I'm out of here but he did it but he did it today. and you know why he did it is because you found all these ways throughout the day to really gently redirect certain yeah him in. yeah okay. and more than words is a great book to kind of yeah get you. Yeah, to help you kind of see how to read those sure. and stuff. And I'll tell you the truth, Kate, you're going to be better at that than anybody else in this world. Sure. Because he is more connected sure. to you yeah. and already has that, that initial foundation with you than sure. anybody else would. So you're doing great with that. Just always think, how can I make him stay with me uh, Right. That's one little new thing right. that you can do. And there's no wrong answer. There's no wrong answer. Uh -huh. only, yeah, and the only thing would be is if you lose it, then you know, Right. That can keep him a little bit longer. Right. Yeah. 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 Cool. You're doing We're great. Gonna... You're doing great. All right. <laughs> okay, we'll see you Monday. <laughs> Successes we have on Monday, but that's okay. Sometimes days two and three are even <laughs> Yeah. So that's okay. And he's a little dysregulating when he got here today. Yeah, he really he was. He wasn't in the really same was. kind of place. I'm going to leave some of these things for you. Okay. And again, the purpose here is to build attention yeah that's our only thing is we wanted to get through it we're not who cares if he puts them in or takes them out just whatever okay just you get him to yeah. interact with the toy yeah. yeah if you can get it at the table it's great it sure have to be at the table and we'll work on yeah we'll work on the tv you know takes break yeah yeah the immediate reward yeah because here's the thing the purpose isn't how great he does when i'm here it's for me to right. give you ideas and for you to be able to take this stuff and use sure. it. Sure, exactly. Some, That's what we're so, looking for. Yeah. Some kids' therapy is their best hour of the week. Some kids, it's the worst hour of the week. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> because That's how it's always been for us. Give you ideas that you can take and use. Okay. And then really do the intervention part. Let's leave the ball with you, too. You sure? Yes. Well, and then I was going to ask you, too, in some of these, 
I, I, like I told John, I was thinking about buying one of these over the weekend, but I didn't because I thought, oh, that's a Laura toy. That's something special he gets to play when Laura's here. I know, and I struggle. I go back and forth between do I want him to do best in therapy or do I want him to do best with you? And hands down, best okay. with you. <laughs> okay, well, that makes sense. More time, obviously. Yeah. And more, yeah. And he understands how oh, to oh, do that. Oh, let me see. So those were really practical, really realistic examples of how coaching parents looks with a real child in a real home. Is it perfect? No, because we're all, we're people. We're all three or four, you know, different people there. But I, you're going to see a lot more of Drew and his mom as we go. And so you'll see how well this works. And I love, you know, we're going to be looking at Drew and how he develops throughout this whole process, but also his wonderful mother and how skilled she became. So great, great examples there. All right, before we move on, let me just stop and say, if you are new to the channel, welcome. We have so many new subscribers. And if you are not new, even if you've been with me a long time since Teach Me To Talk first started in 2008, welcome back. If you haven't done this already, please subscribe to our channel. And if you are a regular, again, I want to thank you for being here. One important way that you can, you can support us is by purchasing the CE credit for this show or by purchasing the handout and you'll find the link to do that right below. That's so important so that we can keep making these courses free for those parents and therapists around the world who can't afford it. So thank you so much for doing that. All right, let's move on now and talk about these initial parent strategies. Now in this course that I'm teaching about coaching, we talked about our coaching models and we've talked about some variables already that make a big difference like timing and being responsive and really reading a child's cues and avoiding power struggles. But now I want to talk to you about some other specific strategies that I teach parents from the very beginning. Now this strategy, what I'm going to talk about this little tagline, is just the best tagline that I think that I've ever come up with. And here's why. Because it works no matter what we're teaching a family, no matter what we're teaching a child. And I'm going to talk about it often in this series. Now these strategies or this little compilation here of how we're going to sum up how we cue a child looks a little bit different depending on what exactly we are teaching, it, but it helps keep us on track with the level of prompting or cueing that we should be providing a child from the least amount of support to the most amount of support. Now, why would we do it that way? Because we don't want a child to become overly dependent on these cues. So when we're cueing a child, we always want to think about, no matter what we're teaching him, that we want to move from the least amount of support to the most amount of support. So why would we do that? Why would we think about providing as little help as we can? Because if that's all the child needs, that's perfect. He's going to be able to move on and again use the skill spontaneously uh, probably a lot faster than when we start with the the most level of cueing here so that's why I really love this system because one it's easy to remember and two it keeps us on track with providing the just the right amount of assistance and we walk a child through this process so usually we start with well let me tell you the line it's called tell him show him help him so if you've taken any of my courses on receptive language, or I use it for everything. I think even in the last series that I taught about apraxia, with cueing a child with apraxia to talk, this is where we start with a verbal cue, like telling him. So again, tell him, show him, help him, and let's walk through these components. So let's start with that first piece, verbal cues with tell him. With lots of things, this is just going to be modeling. And so we've already talked about how important that is for us to do what we want a parent to do. Same thing here with a child. We're going to model or do or say what we want a child to do. So for example, when we're thinking about teaching a new word, what would we do? What would the verbal cue look like here? It would either be saying <laughs> what the word is that we want the child to repeat or telling him, say cookie or say ball or say please. With gestures, it might be you know, telling him wave bye-bye, or again, because we're in the telling piece, it's always going to be that spoken piece. But uh, let's move on and talk about another example. Receptive language. It might be that we're giving a child a verbal command. So we're telling him what to do. So something like go get that truck or find your shoes, those kinds of things. That's the telling him piece. It's stating the expectation of what we want the child to do. With play skills, say we're working on that that we're going to talk about in this series and how we move a child from really, really 
um, concrete play to more abstract play, more pretend play. It might be telling him, oh, put your daddy in the tractor. You know, that would be the verbal cue piece. So it's the telling piece. And again, it's the least amount of support or the least restrictive. We haven't done anything beyond just using our words here. So that's the first one. The next one is the visual cue piece. So this would be showing him. Now this is a big, big part for any child with a language delay. And certainly children with autism who also have difficulty processing and understanding language. How do we know they have process, difficulty processing and understanding language? Well, we know that if they're not following directions consistently, we also know it with our little kids who are, are not using language yet. And again, that we know that for one some reason or another, that language piece is just not as well tuned as we would like. And so again, they may be later to talk. They may be using language that we talked about back in show uh, 437, where we're talking about, in 438, where we're talking about different kinds of uh, repetitious language. So maybe they are echolalic. Maybe they are perseverative. They say the same things over and over and over. Maybe we're not hearing anything. So we know that that, that language processing uh, center or, or locations in that child's brain, for lack of a better word, are not uh, uh, responding to language or to that auditory piece in, in the fact that they're uh, we see the output piece that they're talking and so visual cues are so important for children that we know are struggling to learn to understand and use language so this is going to be the showing him so it could be something like modeling what you want him to do so let's use our play example before as we're saying put the man man in the tractor make the daddy drive after we've said that after a child doesn't do that and again this is in the context of play what would we do what would be the visual part well you could point to the daddy and point to the tractor and and give him the visual cue that way and again it might be modeling it might it might be you saying oh look daddy goes in daddy's in the tractor daddy drives and so again You've shown him, you've shown him what to do. And so you might take the dad back out or or drive or play or do whatever you want to do and then try again where you're giving him that directive in play. And again, you could be working on play skills here, but you might also be working on receptive language, which is, again, following the directions, hearing the words someone else is asking you to do with a request and then following that request or completing that request and following through. And so super, super important, especially with our little guys with autism who might have stronger visual systems than auditory systems. And again, how do we know this? Well, these are kids who may be addicted to screens. They love their iPads. They love watching their YouTube videos. They love the game or the app on mom's phone. We know these kids love visual input. And so when you have a kid who's constantly putting things up to his eyes and stemming with light toys, then you know, oh, this is a kid who could really benefit from visual cueing. And we make those connections, not only as therapists, but we talk about it to parents and we say, He's a visual kid. Look how much he craves visual input. We know that when he's struggling with something, we should show him how to do it. So that's, again, how we connect that information. Uh, let's say that we're working on imitation, which is a big, big part of teaching a child how to talk. And we can't start with words. We can't say, let, let's take an example like teaching him to imitate an action with a toy. So let's take an example like banging on a drum. So instead of saying, I want you to take your hand and beat the drum and say, bang, bang, bang. What are you gonna do? No, you're gonna show him. So you'll model it there. You might say something like, see, look, bang, 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 or you know, boom, 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 whatever word you say there. And even though you're talking, you're still really what? redirecting his visual attention to you. You've said C, and then also you've modeled that. So big, big part there would be showing him what to do. The last piece of this cueing system is help him. Now this is the physical assistance piece. And again, this is the only time that you can think I'm going to make him uh, do this, whatever this task is. We do this, we provide this kind of assistance or we, we offer physical support when it won't upset the routine. We also remember how we talked about the least amount to the most amount of support. This is the most amount of support. So we don't do it with children unless we've tried verbal cues and then we've made it a little more with uh, visual cues and now we've bumped it all the way up to I'm going to help him do it. Sometimes this is 
absolutely necessary to help any toddler learn anything. And as parents, boy, we do it all the time. We shove little feet in shoes and, you know, we brush a child's teeth. We don't wait on him to be able to do it. And so for uh, lots of parents, they don't ever provide physical assistance. And so we're going to help them. And sometimes it's because their child is so resistant to that. They've learned, oh, I better just back off. Sometimes this isn't so bad because we're helping a child do exactly what we want him to do. And then his little body takes over. So we're establishing that motor plan. And that's what happens with lots of our little friends with autism. You know, 63% of children with autism have apraxia, which is motor planning difficulty. And that might be not only for their little mouths for talking, but also for other kinds of movement that they do. They may have a lot of difficulties I get older learning how to hold a pencil unless we've done some hand over hand assistance well let's move this back to toddlerhood they may have difficult time learning how to use a spoon for feeding themselves unless we do a lot of hand over hand to really get that motor plan going might be the same thing for play a child may you can see he's sitting there who wants to put the ball in the hole but he he just doesn't understand that his little hand can do it. This might be a kid who reaches out, like we talked about in show 437, and has abnormal social approach where he's grabbing your hand to make you do the activity. For those kinds of kids, uh, you know, their, their little hand is participating with you already, but take their, help them, take their little hands and help them do it so they can establish that a new motor plan, a new motor routine. The only time you don't do this with a child is when it really sets them off, when they have a lot of tactile aversiveness. And so you might just see this when you're helping them do it. You'll see it. They don't want to touch the Play-Doh. They're resistant for, uh, even for new textures in their mouths. You'll see it that throughout they, they don't like new clothes mom has to be really careful uh, about the the kinds of clothes that they wear so uh, if there's a zipper maybe in in a little jacket or something or a zipper on a uh, say a pullover a quarter zip that touches their skin they may be resistant to that and mom knows oh that's a kid who has tactile aversiveness so those might be the same kids who resist your physical assistance so uh, if if i'm going to set a kid off with that meaning that he's going to run away from me and want to be away from me rather than be with me and participate i'm not going to do a ton of that or if i am i'm going to be really really careful about it firmer touch is always more regulatory than light touch and so you want to be sure that you are uh, analyzing how you use touch with the child and again with a lot of these kids i just ask mom or dad to do the hand over hand assistance part because they're doing it anyway and again unless they're really really passive or unless their child has a low threshold for tolerating physical contact uh, that might be your better option there. But if it triggers a negative reaction, just try to do it without a power struggle and just wait, pleasantly wait for that child to recover and come back around. So it's super important to, indu to introduce those strategies, tell him, show him, help him, even in the context of introduce, do, and review or our parent coaching model. So talk to parents often about these strategies and you'll know that they're including it and understand it when they start using your own words. And so I want to show you a few clips with a wonderful family that I worked with years and years ago. This is a mom that I was with for a long time because her uh, first two little boys were diagnosed with autism. I worked with the older one and then I'm going to show you clips of uh, me with this family with the younger little boy. Uh, I want to show you these clips because lots of the coaching just took place in conversation and i bet that you have that too and here you'll see in these clips that the mom is not as she's she's not just right there beside me working with uh her child she's a little more uh she's she's sitting back i think this had more to do with the video camera being there but i was so thrilled that she let me uh, video and show you this wonderful interaction that we have so i'm going to show you three video clips here back to back so just listen to how naturally these conversations flow and then we'll talk about it after that What do you think? You I haven't quite heard it, but I guess it's doing more. 
I'm really hearing that today. That's brand new. Ball. Yeah. Ball. So those were nice ongoing discussions with that mom about how her child was doing. As I mentioned before, can I make this better? Sure I can. Now watching that, I wish that I had asked her more questions about what she saw with her child versus me always saying this is what I'm hearing. But the truth is sometimes parents, when you ask them those things, it's like a confrontational naming task. They panic. They don't, until you've established a good relationship with them or unless it's just kind of their personality to to get into that flow with you or to, <clears throat> excuse me, be able to answer those questions and not feel like they're on the spot. Some parents can't do that, but I was just so happy to be able to show you today these kinds of clips. 
with the mom where things are going really well. And so this last clip that I want to show you uh, with this family, I want I want you to listen for how she's adapting the strategies. And remember what I said a minute ago, when a parent starts telling you the same words that you've told them, listen here for what she says. I'm asking her how she does something and she says, well, I model it three to five times. You know, she didn't, she knows that because we've talked about it so often. So watch this clip. Good. What should we do now? You want your drink? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you want this? That point oh, was your really good. That point was really good. Yeah. Man. It was. It. That's a lot better too. Sit down. <laughs> good. Yeah. Sit down. Can we open? Open. Good. <laughs> good job. Zip. Zip. Open. Yeah. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about other strategies or principles that all therapists can incorporate and teach parents about working with children with autism. Now these principles are from ABA or Applied Behavioral Analysis. Now ABA has a lot of support in the research for working with children with autism. And when I first found out about ABA, back as a young therapist, my first thought was, wow, I wish I had that kind of time with a kid. I wish I could spend 20 hours a week with one child. He would get a lot better, right? <laughs> I bet you've thought about that too. And so then when I got past that time piece and kind of looking at that, I started looking at other pieces and pulling in other things. What makes ABA so successful with children with autism? And how can I take those principles and incorporate that into my practice? Now, I'm a play-based uh, therapist because I work with children in this earliest developmental period, birth to three or birth to five, in that critical language window here. And I, so I know that I'm going to stay relationship-based and play-based because I do feel like that's the best way to teach children to learn how to communicate but there's this whole other body of evidence that says I can tweak these kinds of things and get better results, particularly for our children with autism. So let's talk about these things and talk about what we can do as speech language pathologists or other kinds of early intervention professionals, OTs, PTs, a developmental interventionist, and, and we can use these same principles and we don't have to throw out our relationship-based approaches to use these kinds of principles. And the truth is, I have so many ABA therapists who contact me or who use these courses for their own continuing education uh, opportunities within their own state. So again, these principles can be applied and it's successful for all of us. So let me show you what these are. Number one, go fast. So why am I saying go fast? As a therapist, you might have been taught, go slow, slow down for processing time. These are toddlers who are not learning language. You better back it way up. That's true for some of our little friends, but for other friends, we need to go a little faster because that's gonna rev up their system and again, get them more primed to talk and certainly to communicate. When we go faster, we also keep a toddler's attention. There's not time for him to scamper off and do something else because he's focused on what we want him to do. We kept it alive and going and moving. It also reduces the opportunities for undesirable things to happen. 
for, like we said before, distraction or for behavioral issues where he starts using the toy as a weapon against us <laughs> because we've not kept things exciting enough and moving fast enough. And I'll tell you too, going fast also keeps parents involved. And so if you have a parent or a family who seems to kind of want to hang back and not really stay in there with you, a parent who's wanting to scroll or kind of nap a little bit. And again, I'm not knocking those things. Parents are having to be with their children all day, every day. It is very demanding to parent any child with a developmental difference and certainly with autism. But these things that we're using, they can help keep parents engaged too. So this that's a suggestion for you. Going fast does not mean over talking and it certainly does not mean loud. And I have been accused of both of those things. <laughs> so I can say those things. But at the same time, we think about just speeding it up, just keeping it a little bit uh, faster than we normally might be with that child and again to keep his little system primed and ready to go. So it's finding that just right place that we talked about before. We talked about emotional regulation in this way and here the speed of what we're doing, the speed of how we're playing, the speed of how we're cueing, the speed of how we're that back and forth flow that we've talked about. Fast usually equals fun for toddlers. So think about that, particularly if we have a little uh, uh, child who, uh, again, it works for, it would work for either, either uh, opposite side of the spectrum as far as arousal goes. Our low arousal kids do need us to speed it up a little bit so that they can rev up. And even our kids who are a little bit hyper aroused and who, who are more alert, who are busy, who are runners and jumpers and climbers, just our sensory seekers, they appreciate the faster approach because that's where their system already is. And so again, I like to say fast equals fun for toddlers. So that's number one, go fast. Number two, time matters. So we're talking about time again. We started out saying timing is everything with when we introduce a strategy, we wanna make kids or, or wanna make sure kids are in their just right place. But let's talk about time in a different way. And I mentioned this already for ABA. The recommendation for ABA is 20 to 25 hours a week of instruction with their ABA person. Floor time, the relationship-based approach that I think is so successful with autism, uh, pioneered by Dr. Stanley Greenspan, he also recommended that same amount of time, 20 to 25 hours a week. So where did they get this time? This is initially uh, based on the amount of interaction that typically developing toddlers and preschoolers get with their parents. So it's kind of the research answer for how much time does it take for a child to learn how to communicate? 20 to 25 hours a week. How much time does it take for a child to learn kind of those pre-academic concepts or pre-cognitive, not pre-cognitive, but pre-school concepts, things that we kind of think for 20 to 25 hours a week. That's what the, the research showed how much time uh, typically developing toddlers get with language interaction with their parents. With our little guys with autism, in, and our other little guys who have other kinds of speech language delays, same thing. We need to make sure that they're receiving that level of time and engagement because especially our little guys with autism, they may not seek it out. And so we know time matters. And so this is a very important piece of information to share with parents at the beginning. Most of the time you're going to get some kind of response like, I can never do that amount of time. That's more than that's more than we could do. Or even even something that's even a little more resistant, like, well, we both work full time. How do we expect us to do that? And so we have to just again talk with parents about what they can realistically do. For some families, all they can really do throughout the day when they kind of do a little time study and add it up, maybe they're they're getting two hours a day, you know, two times seven, 14 hours. Guess what? It's probably 13 more hours than they got before, right? And so talk with parents about that and talk about how, why that recommendation is there and then how they can move toward that. And I'll just say, the parents that I've been able to get to buy into this and really spend more time with their children working on these skills, working on the social piece, the interaction piece, working on the cognitive things that we introduce through play and the other things that we're going to talk about in this series. Uh, the receptive language piece, working on specifically how can I help my child understand more words, meaning I'm going to give him directions in play routines to follow. I'm going to teach him how to follow directions at bath time. I'm going to teach him how to follow directions while I'm putting dishes away and he's with me in the kitchen. 
those things matter and those things add up. So the parents who have gotten so skilled about that, who've said, hey, I'm just going to devote you know, X amount of time to this every day or, you know, over the course of a week. Those are the families that have made the most progress. And I even hear about that with emails that teach me to talk, where a family will will take the time to send me an email and say, you know, I didn't really believe you about the time or I didn't think I had enough time, but I just started doing this and playing social games with my child and completing some of the specific play routines that you recommend. And you know what? He got better and that made me want to do it even more. And so then I started setting aside more time for this. And so it's super, super important that parents understand the time piece, even if they can't get to that magic number of 20 or 25 hours a week, They know about it and you've told them about it and you've told them how evidence-based it is. So that's what we need to be sure we're doing. All right, the next piece here is thinking about structure. And I want to say structure works is what I said for this principle. Now, when we think about traditional ABA, what do we think about? We think about a therapist sitting at a table with a child using flashcards or some other kind of visual a uh, presentation of the material and then a child does something different and then the therapist rewards them that kind of thing i'm not talking about that although sometimes children with autism do need that level of structure and you might uh, have seen some courses that i've taught in the past where i'm sitting with a child at a table and you know i am the play person i'm talking about toys and we're up and we're moving and we're doing move sit move sit move sit But for some of our little guys with autism, they really need that structure of this is where my body goes when I sit in this chair and this is where I play. And that works better for them just because of how their little systems are organized. So you'll just have to experiment with that. And I'm not really just talking about the physical structure or the physical environment i'm really talking about just knowing that you have to have a plan for every session as a therapist and if you've kind of gotten caught up in that early intervention state program programming where they say you're just going to go in and let the parent decide and whatever they're doing you just fit yourself in there and Da, 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 da. I get emails from parents who say, you know, I'm not accomplishing much of anything because all we're doing is talking. And it's so important. You know, we talked about discussing and explaining back with our introduce, do, and review. And two parts of that, the introduce part and the review part of that are a lot of explaining and discussing, but they're missing the doing part. And so that's the structure. We have to really help parents and and, and we can best do that by having that in mind and having a plan with what we're going to do for every session, every time we see a family. And so again, the plan may not be the activity. You may not be planning. Like when I did home visits, especially when I started with home visits, Back in the 90s, my planning might have been standing at the trunk of my car and saying, I'm going to play with bubbles, and then we're going to do some puzzles, and then I better take a book, and oh, we're working on pretend play, so I'm going to take my farm here, and then I'm going to have this baby doll. I'm not even talking about the activity planning, although that's important too. I'm also, though, talking about our strategies, like like I said before. With this is the strategy I'm using, and these are the five activities that we could do that in. What do you think might work? Burp work best and what would be worst and so those might be the things that you're doing that's your plan and so that's your structure many children on the autism spectrum need that structure and need that to be able uh, to learn the things that you're trying to teach them and then be able to apply that and so when we don't handle the structure part sometimes we're not as successful as we could be so don't let your programs talk you out of that Let's look at our fourth principle here, and I've kind of lumped this, and these are all very therapy-based terms, but you'll understand what I mean by them. Motivate, pair, and reinforce. So let's just, let me do it just the way I talk to parents about this. We're talking about motivate, pair, and reinforce. Instead of using the term motivate, I say, hey, let's figure out what he likes, and let's do that. And instead of using the term reinforce, I say, hey, let's figure out what he likes, and let's do that. Or instead of using the term pairing, let's figure out what he likes, so let's do that. Do you see what I mean by that? So this is how ABA people take, again, something that's very, very positive for a child. is motivating. He wants to do it. 
They take that and put it with something that's maybe not so motivating and he wants to do it. And then they also reinforce by taking something that the child loves and putting it with that with something else or with whatever you're working on because that's what he likes. And so let's take an activity like learning how to talk learning how to say a word. So what can we do in that context? We better figure out what he wants to ask for. What is something that would motivate him to talk? That's what we're talking about here, you know, d determining his preferences. Okay, so then we, what do we think? What can I pair? What Take something he loves and pair it with something that's harder. So uh, same, same kind of concept here. So learning how to talk is hard, but he loves goldfish crackers. All right, that's going to motivate him to talk. And I'm pairing those goldfish crackers with him talking. And guess what? The goldfish crackers also become the reinforcement. He gets to eat it. He wants another one. So that's my whole premise here. The terminology is not that important. We have to figure out what a child likes, what he loves, and then use that again for motivation, for pairing with other things, for reinforcing. We figure out a kid's favorite anything, and then we use that to teach him everything. All right, and the last principle here is balancing mastered skills with new skills. Now, this is really hard for lots of us in therapy because we think, I can't work on something he already knows how to do. I can't, I'm supposed to be teaching him something new. And for speech pathologists, you know, what do we do? We go straight for that word. Even though a kid has never said anything, you know, we start working on that talking piece regardless maybe of what he can do or where he is in that developmental continuum. And so I like that ABA therapists have a ratio of about 75% to 25%. And it's not 75% new, 25% balanced, really it's we want to keep those emerging skills and those skills that again are close to mastery. We want to keep working on those so we can get master, I've said mastery five times now, but that's what we're working for. So we can get a kid to mastery on those things and he doesn't get there without practice. And so we have to meet kids where they are developmentally. And a lot of times that just means we're going to start with what they can already do. And this is so important for us in therapy to not always be going to that new word, new sign, new, 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 new. Here's the truth. When we give a kid's system a chance to catch up and organize and really, again, own those skills, the new goals are going to be met more quickly too because he's got, he's, he's got a foundation on which to build instead of everything always being new. So you can't just teach a sign or a word a couple of sessions and then never work on it again. You've got to really keep that practice going so that that child can learn to use that skill and generalize that skill. And so repetition of mastered skills helps the child retain those skills. And we know that in autism, that's a big, big concern with losing skills. And so that's how we want to explain that to parents. So these are my best tips for coaching parents with our overall strategies and considerations. So let's just review that coaching model one more time. We'll introduce an activity or strategy. Remember what we said? We were going to take a strategy and then have like four or five different examples and ask a parent, you know, what would he do best at? What will he do struggle with the most? You know, and think about how we can uh, address both of those kinds of things. We talked about the doing piece, which really means modeling for that parent, what we want them to do, participating in that activity with the parent, with the parent also doing as much of the doing as they're comfortable with and over time that should gradually increase where you are giving more of that ownership and more of that leadership within a session to the parents so that they can be able to generalize that and then lastly the review piece where you both reflect and you talk about how it went and then you tweak you decide this is what we're going to do differently next time or this is how we can bump this skill up to this next little level. So introduce, do, and review were those three parts of the parent training program. We also had those principles that we can incorporate from ABA. Go fast, it keeps kids and parents with you. Time matters, we wanna to try to get as much interaction and engagement and teaching time with the child as possible. We want research tells us 20 to 25 hours a week. We're going to try to get there uh, the best we can. And again, it might be over time. The third piece here, structure works. We have to have a plan. We have to also provide the physical environment that a child needs to learn. And that's with experimentation. And my move, sit, move, sit, move, sit is a great structure 
for we as early interventionists to follow because it keeps a kid with you, but it also gives this little sensory system time to regulate. And so we talk to parents about providing that structure and that framework based on uh, their own child's needs. Our fourth piece here, model, pair, and reinforce. We said we were gonna pick a child's favorite anything and use it to teach him everything. And then our last piece with that was balancing mastered skills with new skills. And we wanna keep practicing those old skills so that they don't lose those. So words that they've said for a long time, that's fine for you to use in the context of therapy. I know that you already know that, but that's something that you're going to want to share with parents. And then our last set of little strategies that we talked about today were tell him, show him, help him. And you are gonna hear me talk about those strategies throughout the rest of this series because it's such an important way to teach children, children with autism anything. All right. I also, before we're finished with this course today, is I want to give you a preview of the strategies and the videos that we're going to be seeing uh, throughout the remainder of this series. So first, we're going to talk about helping uh, what it means to meet a child where he or she is. I'm going to help you be able to do that because I think it's the first thing that we mess up as speech language pathologists and other therapists in early intervention when we're working with a child we start with a goal that's way too high and when we should be meeting a child where he is and really establishing that relationship and then moving forward secondly we're going to talk about social games and how important those are for children with autism and how we can teach so many uh, communicative skills within the context of a social game. We can work on attention and that reciprocity piece, the social engagement piece. We can work on receptive language where a child is following directions and really learning how to do his part and participate. We can work on the expressive language piece where he starts to do some gestures or do the hand motions with the songs and then eventually fill in some words and verbal routines and then eventually use the words on his own. So social games are a critical part of working with any young child with autism. Thirdly, we're going to talk about play skills and how we can take a child from not playing or from for from stemming with toys to moving to a more traditional kinds of play. And so we'll talk about the methodologies that we use with that. If play skills aren't moving along, the fourth thing that we're going to talk about is then we back up to structured teaching. And that's a very specific treatment protocol that I want to share with you that's highly effective. It's actually on one of the uh, evidence-based intervention list for autism and recognized as a really solid treatment approach to helping children learn how to play with toys and participate in other kinds of structured academic activities. Next, we're going to work specifically on receptive language. And I always talk about this with kids with autism with do your part. We're going to teach a kid how to do his part. And again, lots of our little friends with autism tend to self-isolate or uh, prefer to do their own things, or as the Hannon people say, follow their own agendas. So we're gonna talk about receptive language and how we can help children on the autism spectrum learn how to process and understand language. The next piece, we'll talk about some other specific problems. Jargon and echolalia, which we talked about, can be a core deficit in autism with children who use repetitive language. And again, that's a kind of STEM. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about how to facilitate peer interaction or get those little friendships going so that children can, even before that, so that they can participate in their preschool programs or in say circle time at their daycare program so that we can get those early communicative uh, activities going with same age peers. We're gonna focus on imitation, which is one of the things that I teach no matter what course uh, I'm talking about, whether it's autism or apraxia or being a light talker or anything, imitation is so important and it's a critical skill that we need to teach our little friends with autism. We're also gonna talk about PECS, or the picture exchange communication system and how effective that is with children with autism. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about specifically getting verbal routines going. This is just really, really, really a, a very targeted approach and it works beautifully with lots of verbal children with autism. So I wanna be sure that I'm teaching you that. So when we're looking at those strategies, we're gonna define and discuss the approach or strategy. I wanna be sure to get you started with that because sometimes getting started is the hardest part. So that's what we'll be talking about in this series. We're also going to talk about what you might see in your own child or in a child that you're working with that would let you know this is the strategy that he or she needs. We're going to watch therapy clips like we've done in this course where we took a look at 
uh, parents and how they were responding and how they're learning strategies with their own children. We're going to do that throughout with the whole list of 10 strategies and approaches that I just read you. And then I'm also going to talk about other resources that might be helpful for you, particularly the resources that we have at Teach Me to Talk. So I'll be telling you about therapy manuals that would help you or other videos that you can watch here on YouTube so that you can get the information you need. All right, so that's what we're going to do in the rest of this series. I also want to let you know that the kids and the families that you saw in this course today will be with us throughout the series. So I hope that you will share in my excitement with the progress that we see from session to session. So I'm so excited to bring it to you. Uh, one more thing before we finish today, I'm going to share with you a resource that I mentioned in my other courses in this series and it's called the Autism Workbook. It's a workbook that I developed based on a, a, a little book that I wrote for Amazon on Kindle called Is It Autism? This is the extension of that and this is where I walk you through designing and developing a treatment plan. And again, you can use this if you're a parent, if you're a mom or a dad and you're struggling with what should I be doing with my child at home? He's getting all this therapy, but I know that I can do something different. I know if I just had a tool, if somebody would just tell me what to do, well, that's what I've done in this book is really help you decide the components of the treatment plan that you should be using for the child that you're working with and I do that with questions that are attached to those focus areas that I mentioned earlier that you can really figure out how you can be most effective so the link for this tool is below so check that out there uh, in the post below and you can get more information uh, about the autism workbook all right that's all for this show I'm Laura Mize pediatric speech language pathologist and thank you so much for joining me for teach me to talks podcast <music>